Jenny for inviting me out here, and the, the ladies, uh, I'll give a shout out to the ladies of St. Peter the Apostle Parish. Yes, thank you. We, we actually are in the Diocese of San Diego. Uh, a lot of people think that we're in the Diocese of San Bernardino, but we're, we're actually the northernmost uh, diocese, uh, uh, parish in the diocese. Um, I want to tell you a story. Jesus was a great storyteller. I think that's how he brought people into his heart. And today you're going to get a two for one. So I'm, I'm going to tell you my story, uh, my testimony, which, believe it or not, is kind of hard to distill down 50 something odd years of my life into like 50 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. But I also wanted to tell you another story a story about a woman. Story about a woman who uh, was born before the Great Depression and was one of seven children uh, born into a Catholic family. And she was the middle child. She had three older sisters and three younger brothers. And when she was a teenager, her mother passed away. It was one of the first trials that she went through. And her father was. Uh, a bit of a sullen man to begin with, and when his wife passed away, he became uh, abusive. Um, he was a drinker, and uh, he regularly beat um, this woman. Um, and she stayed in the house because she was trying to take care of her and her brothers, but there came a point when she got old enough that she just, she couldn't stay there anymore. And, and so she left. And she was looking for that love that she knew God had for her, but she couldn't find it in her own house. And she met a man who loved her for the precious child of God that she was. And they fell in love, deeply in love, and were married actually fairly shortly after they met. Um, this woman, as I said, was Catholic, but this young man that she met was uh, Protestant. And back in the day, um, they couldn't get married in the sanctuary of the church. So uh, the priest married them in the North Acts. So that's where they got married. And they uh, had a little house and um, were living the American dream. Uh, within a couple of months, um, she became pregnant and gave birth to a lovely young girl. And she thought that, you know, God was smiling on her finally in her life. And about six months after the baby girl was born, there was a knock on her door. And a couple of men were there and told her that her husband had died. You see, her husband was a coal miner in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And so she couldn't believe that after all the suffering that she had in her life, she finally was in this happy place where God was blessing her. And now she had this great tragedy. And she didn't know what to do. You can imagine a woman in the late 40s she didn't have a job, and so she was invited to move in with her one girl, her sisters, and her husband, who coincidentally could not have children. And the three of them raised this young lady. And I'm going to let you just sit and think about what life must have been like for this woman and her child. Well, I tell you a little bit about my story, but don't worry, I'll come back to that story. As a matter of fact, I'm going to come back to that story specifically because I believe that there are not coincidences in life. There is only the God that we love and know working in our lives. And part of my story is going to have to do with this picture that's over here, but I'll get back to that. I'd like to tell you that I was born one cold December night in the middle of a blizzard. 
but I can't. It was a cold January night, and it was a blizzard. And I was born in New Jersey um, to, yeah, is there any Jersey people out there? Uh, um, I was born in New Jersey 50-something um, years ago. Um, my parents were both Catholic. Um, and I was raised a uh, cradle Catholic along with my younger brother. And we lived a very sort of normal Catholic life, but I wouldn't say we sort of embraced our faith, right? We were those maybe more than nominal Catholics, right? But we, we went to church every Sunday, most of the time, right? And we said grace, and that was probably about the extent of it. You know, my mom would come in and tuck us in and say Hail Mary to us before we went to bed. But that was the extent of my Catholicism until I was about 10 years old. And my parents went to a Bible study. Like, I'm guessing something similar to what you all go to. And they came back changed. You might, you might have noticed my last name is Rotunda. I'm a Paisano. And uh, my father was a, a, a full-blooded Italian, and still is, you ladies have seen him. Um, he was a man um, to be reckoned with when he was younger. Uh, he was a four-letter athlete in college and high school. He went on to be a uh, physical education uh, professor. And so he didn't mess with, with my dad. He was a stern guy. Um, and I honestly often did not see the love of Christ in him. I saw the fear of God. <laughs> and so what was remarkable to me was that after my parents started going to this Bible study, I could see a change in him. I started to see the love of God in him. And as a young man, when you're initially just scared of your father, right? You don't want to do anything wrong because you're afraid of what he's going to say or worse, what he's going to do. It was, I think, the first time that I started to have an experience of God's love in a real way in my life, seeing that change. And seeing the change in my parents, the way they loved each other was different. And about a year later, I was playing kick the can in my backyard. You guys know what kick the can is? Oh, no, it's something on Google. Oh, no. Okay, so so kick the can is you get an old Folgers coffee can, you put it in the center, and you would go and it was like hide and seek with with a can kick. <laughs> so you would hide and you'd go around and try to. See your friends and you would go on top of the can and say, I see Jim and he's hiding behind the tree. And your job was to try to get into the can and kick it before the spotter could find you. So I was really good at kicking the can. And I was, I was running in and I was going to kick that can and my buddy was coming in and we collided and I fell and just cracked my side really bad. I got up uh, just not good. But I'm a 11 year old boy, so that's not gonna stop me, right? So I'm playing kick the can probably for the rest of the afternoon. And I got called in by my mom as I normally did when the sun was going down and it was time for us to eat. And uh, as I was instructed to do, I washed up before uh, we had meals. And I went to the bathroom because I was a boy outside all day. I hadn't even contemplated going to the bathroom. And I should warn you, I am a physician as well, so I'm going to use some very frank terms. I urinated pure blood into the toilet and uh, passed out. Uh, and so all I know is my mom came in screaming, looking over me on this and I woke up and again I got my pants down and my mom she's screaming I start screaming because I'm naked my mom's looking at me 
and, there, and it, was, it, it looks like a scene out of The Exorcist. There's just blood all over the place. So of course, my mom, who's also a registered nurse, um, called 911 and off we went to the hospital. And they did a bunch of tests, and they're like, well, he just probably fell down and injured his kidney, bruised his kidney, everything's gonna be fine, don't worry about it. Well, about a month later, everything was fine, and I wasn't doing anything abnormal, and I went to use the restroom, and I urinated pure blood, and I passed out again. So off to the hospital we went, to had to get the tests, and this time it didn't stop every time I went to the bathroom. I was peeing blood. Aren't you glad you're not eating much? <laughs> so this went on for a couple of years. Wow. I would intermittently have these episodes, and um, I again I lived in New Jersey at the time, so I went to every pediatric urologist between New York and Philadelphia and everywhere in between to try to figure out what was going on, and, and they frankly just could not figure out what was going on. And so I started doing what you do when you're sick and you're Catholic. You pray. So I started praying a lot. And you know what happened? Nothing. Exactly. So I, like, no. I got more. I, I, not only am I praying, but the Bible studies praying, and everybody's praying for me. Our parish priests, we had three of them. We were we flush with priests. They're praying. Everybody's praying. Nothing's happening. Except more hospital bills and more blood. And so I went to, uh, we had a young priest come in as an associate. He had just been ordained. And he, you know, he's one of those cool priests, no offense, but he, he was one of those young hip guys, right? And so, you know, all, all, of the, all of the teenagers wanted to sort of hang out with him because he was a cool priest. And, you know, I, he told them what was going on, and he said, um, Stop praying for yourself. He said, I don't know what God has in store for you, but there are people that are suffering far worse than you in this world. And so I want you to offer up whatever suffering you're having for them. And I want you to pray for acceptance because there are great saints who've lived with far worse. St. Paul, you know, he had that stitch in his side. We don't know exactly whether that was the stigma or something else, but, you know, God's grace is enough for him. It's enough for you. So pray. Okay. And he says, the last thing I want you to do is pray for peace. Because you, know, you, you clearly don't have peace in your life. So I started offering up my suffering. And about a year later, they told me that I was going to have to have an operation where they were going to explore my kidney to see if they could figure out what was going on. Because I had every ultrasound, CAT scan, uh, every, I mean, I, I won't get into the plumbing aspects of what was going on, but none of it was fun, gentlemen, especially you guys at the back table over there. You didn't want anything that I had to deal with. <clears throat> so, they told me that I was, I had two options, that I could be on bed rest for an entire summer, or they could open me up and figure out if they could find out what was going on and maybe just take my kidney. And, of course, I'm a teenager, and I'm like, you're going to do what? You're going to cut me open and take out my kidney, and you don't even know if that's what the problem is exactly? No thanks. So I'll, I'll take, you know, what's behind door number two. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I laid, I was 14, and I laid in bed for an entire summer. So all my buddies are outside playing kick the can, or whatever else they can play, and I'm laying in bed praying. And at the end of that summer, they did some tests and said, well, there's no more blood in your urine, so hopefully, you know, you'll be okay. Hopefully. <laughs> You're doctors. You're supposed to know these things. Well, six months went by, a year went by, and um, the 
head urologist that we've been seeing said to me, we can't, we don't find any more blood in your urine microscopically, and you haven't had any more episodes, so we think you're cured. And I said, well, you, you didn't, you, you thought you knew what was causing this, and you didn't, and now you think I'm cured. Well, I will tell you, I know I'm cured. Because I believe that God healed me. I believe that whatever was going on was bringing me closer to Him, and was an opportunity for me to feel his love and his healing. He said, well, it sort of sounds like a miracle. I said, you said it, not me. <laughs> and as far as I know, it was a miracle. It was three years of my life where doctors, very skilled, very educated, um, somewhat compassionate at times, couldn't figure out what was going on. To this day, I don't know what was going on. And I can say that with um, some expertise because I am a physician. However, if you had told me then that I would be a doctor, I would have laughed at you long and hard. Because after three years of being poked and prodded and told by people who were supposed to know what was going on with me that they didn't know what was going on, I didn't want to ever see another doctor again, let alone be in another hospital again. But when I, when I was healed, I felt really strongly that I needed to get back to the church. And when you're you know, a teenager, there's not a lot you can do. So I um, had a reasonably good singing voice, so I sang in the choir. And um, I be, as soon as I was confirmed, I became a lecturer. And within a couple of months of me reading fairly regularly um, at the parish, I had... Um, some older women come up to me. I won't say old ladies, but that's what they were. <laughs> they, they came up to me, and different, different ones saying, you know, you read so well. You should be a priest. A priest. Exactly. Yes, no, no, they didn't say that. They said, you should be a priest. And I'm like, a priest? I don't, I don't think I want to be a priest. But we but within the span of like six weeks, I must have had six different women come over to me and say, you should be a priest. So I went to, to Father Joe, the, you know, the cool priest, and I said, hey, uh, Father, um, I got a bunch of ladies here that are telling me I should be a priest. And he said, well, what do you think about it? I said, I don't, I don't think about it at all, quite frankly. And he said, well, you should think about it. He said, you know, part of our life is discerning what God is calling us to. And whether that's being a priest or religious or a single or married man, that's something that you need to start praying about. So I prayed. And I specifically prayed about whether God was calling me to be a priest. And I heard crickets. I, I, I got nothing back. And so I, you know, I spent a little time talking to Father Joe, and he was like, look, if God is calling you the priesthood, you'll figure that out. And so, just keep praying. Just keep discerning. So that's the first time I, in my life I really thought about the concept of discernment, and that has come up many more times in my life. Um, but I think, you know, I see a couple of younger folks here today. We, we don't, we as church, don't do a good enough job about telling our youth about the need for discernment. And I was very lucky that I had a priest who sort of took me under his wing and introduced me to that concept because my life, I think, would have been far different um, than it is today had I not started really looking to God's guidance in my life early on. So um, in, in high school, I thought that I wanted to be, as I told you, I don't want to be anything related to the medical field whatsoever. So I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And specifically, I wanted to be a public defender because I felt like that would be something that God would be proud of, right? Taking the case of these folks that don't have enough money, enough resources, often have been sort of abused by the system, and, and, and being able to be a servant to them. And so my first 
here in, in college, I went to a small old liberal arts call, college called Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, who none of you have heard of, I'm absolutely sure. Tiny little school, Methodist school. Um, and I was uh, majoring in biology, minoring in political science, and that was going to be my hook. Bio was going to be my hook to get into to, to, uh, law school. And one of my dad's really good friends took me aside um, over Christmas break and said, you don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be, I'd be a public defender. I was a public defender. Well, it was great, wasn't it? No, it was not. <laughs> and so I'm like, but you're ringing them. I'm like, great, let me ring them into some more. <laughs> so he said, look, you know, you'll see the same guys going in and out through the system, and you're going to get really disillusioned. Then you're going to do what I did, which is I got into corporate law. And if you want to be a, again, this was in the 80s, if you want to be a good corporate lawyer, you're going to spend 80 hours a week at the office trying to move up the ladder in order to make a partner and make money. And I said, I know you, and you're going to want to be a family man. And those two things are not in right alignment with each other. Find something else to do. I go back to school for my second semester, my freshman year, kind of like, you know, really? So I started praying again, right? God, what do you want me to be doing? And over that break, I told you my mom's a nurse. I was invited to work in her office, and she would bring me in to see the interesting cases. And I was far enough away from the experience I had in my early teen years. I started getting really interested, and I saw what, what she was doing, how she was making an impact in people's lives. I got back to college, and the head of the Department of Biology takes me aside and says, you have the highest GPA in the freshman class. Uh, you need to be doing bio full time and be a, be a major. And I said, well, I haven't taken all these other classes because I wasn't thinking about medicine. And he goes, well, we'll get you, we'll get you in that for next year, but I want you, I want you to seriously think about really dedicating yourself to, to biology. So I got home um, from my finals my first year, and my parents take me out to dinner, and I tell them, I said, you know, I, uh, I've been praying a bunch, and I was recruited by the um, head of the Department of Biology to, to major, and I think that God's not calling me to be a lawyer anymore. And my dad was like, well, you better have a plan, son. <laughs> And I said, don't worry, Dad, I've been praying about it, and I do. I really believe in my heart that God's calling me to be a physician. And my mother starts crying. <laughs> oh, no, they were tears of joy. No, no, no. No, she, I, I, she took her water goblet and did this. I forbid you to be a doctor. Oh, my gosh. You, you forbid me? Yeah, I forbid you. My mom's not Italian, um, by birth, <laughs> but you would never know it. Uh, I'd much rather, to this day, I'd much rather have my father angry with me, because I knew whatever was gonna happen was gonna be over and done with very quickly. I never would have my mom angry with me. So, uh, what are you talking about? Well, again, you gotta remember, this was sort of during the height of the AIDS crisis, right? And my mom knew professionals, doctors, and nurses who had um, gotten needle sticks and contracted HIV, and she didn't want that for her son. And yet I said, you know, well, you're going to have to talk to the man upstairs because he's calling me to this. Second concern. I come back to school, and as I said, I'm, I'm sort of behind in some of the classes that I made. I didn't take chemistry, didn't really like it very much in high school, and I was, I know, I'm sort of just skipping it. But since I was majoring, I needed to actually take chemistry. And so I, I, I'm a sophomore going into a freshman chemistry class, and I don't expect to know anybody. And when I go into class, I actually see this kid, Pete, who I met. I was, uh, I was an ambassador for the school, so we would host people from far away and they'd stay overnight at the dorm and you'd show them a good time. Not too good a time, but you know. Um, anyway, we would, uh, 
he was he wanted to be a double major in biology and political science, so they assigned him to me. So it was really sort of nice to get in the, the class and see Pete. So I sat down, hey Pete, how are you? I'm so glad that you came to True. It must have been because of the time you spent with me, right? Yeah, no. 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 Yeah. He, uh, he, he recognized me and remembered me, and he introduced me to this girl that he had met uh, while um, they were in line to pick up their computers. Again, back then, getting a computer was a big deal on college campus. Right now, everybody has a computer. They just have a cell phone or whatever. But um, So I met this really mousy little girl um, who I like to call my wife now. <laughs> Um, and, and the ladies are laughing because they, they know as a deacon's wife, she's not mousy, but when I met her, oh my goodness, she was a much different lady. Um, so I, I like to say, here's, here comes the dad joke, we had chemistry from the start. Thank you, thank you, I'm here all week, try the wheel. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so my, uh, my then um, study buddy, uh, about a year later, we started actually dating after we had become really good friends studying together. And uh, she wanted to go to medical school as well, and so we uh, both worked really hard in college, went to Penn State for med school, uh, graduated at the top of our class, and then went to Philadelphia for residency. Um, I uh, studied emergency medicine at what was the Medical College of Pennsylvania, and um, Hahnemann Hospital. My wife uh, went to Jefferson. And life was good. I mean, even as residents, we, we were thankful for what we had. I mean, uh, a can of uh, Franks and Beans was two meals. Um, but, you know, being, being four physicians together, I think, gives you um, grace so that when you um, have more money, um, you were really thankful and know that that gift, that gift that God has given you to heal um, is, is to be used not only in the act of healing, but the, the, the grace that comes with it monetarily is to be given back to your community. So we, how did, how did we get out here? Well, my, my dad's best friend and brother from another mother um, moved to Fallbrook and my parents moved out here to, uh, to retire out here with him. And when you are um, eating franks and beans as two meals, um, you look for a cheap vacation. And there is no cheaper vacation than taking the $99 Super Saver flight out here uh, to San Diego, bombing your parents' car, and eating tacos at Carlsbad State Beach <laughs> in March. Because okay. back in Philadelphia, it is three feet of snow on the ground. But here, beautiful. So um, we decided to, to move out here. And um, we also, crazy kids, decided to build our own house. And so we were living with my parents, um, which when you've been out of school for 10 years and married and moved back in with your parents, that's a whole other, I mean, I could spend another hour just talking about that. Um, and while we were living with my folks, we also um, got pregnant with our first child. I know it's amazing, but that happened in my parents' house. <laughs> it did. Um, and, you know, life was good. Um, I was a gainfully employed emergency physician who was offered partnership with this group. My wife was also offered partnership at the same time. We prayed to God about what we should do um, because we sort of, our original thought was that uh, my wife worked part time. She's a dermatologist. Somebody in here is her patient there. She is. Um, and um, so I thought that I'd, I'd work full time. My wife would work part time and um, uh, she would take care of the kids. And then um, we got offered a partnership and uh, she was going to make three times as much money as I was working like regular bankers type hours. And I was going to be working nights and weekends and holidays um, until I died. <laughs> and so we prayed. And it was pretty clear that either one of us 
want to, to do what God was calling us to. I really felt strongly that as the man I should be like providing for my family, right? And that uh, she wanted to be the mom staying home and nurturing the kids. And yet it didn't, it, it didn't make any sense for our family. So after praying about it, um, we decided to do what God called us to do, which was for me to become Mr. Mom and for her to work full time. And uh, for me to be Mr. Mom, what was gonna make most sense was me to start working nights. So um, uh, I became a nocturnist. That's what we call, yes, that's what we call doctors who work in the graveyard shift. Some of us are referred to as vampires, but uh, yeah, we like the term nocturnists. And so life was good, right? Life is good. I'm a, I'm a physician, my wife's a physician. We have nice cars, we have a nice house. Um, we have a beautiful daughter, and we are um, looking forward to having more kids. And about two years after our daughter is born, um, my wife is pregnant again. And we are so, so thankful. Sorry. I brought these. Um, until about six weeks later, when my wife tells me that she's bleeding really heavily. And we go to the OBGYN, and he informs us that She's having a miscarriage. And we're, you know, we're both physicians, and we realize that about 75% of women will experience miscarriage in their life. And so, okay, we'll, you know, we'll get on with our lives, and we'll try again and have another child. About a year later, God blesses us with that double line on the stick. And about six weeks later, she starts bleeding. And so, um, you know, we're a little older because we started having uh, our family after we got out of residency. And so we talked to her with Julianne about maybe we should do some testing, make sure everything's okay. And so we go through all of the testing and everything is fine. And the, you guys, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to have more kids. Okay. So about nine months later, another double line. Six weeks later, another miscarriage. Six months later, another double line. Eight weeks later, another miscarriage. This was a really, really dark time in our lives. It was a dark time for my wife. Um, she, she knows that I, just so you ladies all know, she is well aware that I am sharing this with you. Um, she got really angry with God. She could not understand why a woman who initially wanted to not be a dermatologist but be a neonatologist because she loved children so much was not being able to do what was supposed to be really natural for a woman and that's to have kids. And I never got angry with God. I, I don't, I will tell you this, I have not been angry with God one day in my life there's, I don't know if it's the Italian in me or what, but like the concept of the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God, I'm going to get angry with you? I mean, why? Right? I, I, so I, there's been this grace in my life that I, I, I've never really understood getting angry with God. I understand that you can get angry with God, but I just never did. I, it was something I didn't feel like, like, who am I to be angry with you? I was sad. I was sad with what was going on, and, and worse yet, I was brokenhearted for my wife. That I, you know, you you ladies, if you've been married, and you gentlemen scattered in this room, you know what we we as men like to do, right? Fix things, right? That's what we're good at. That's how we, that's our love language. We want to fix things, and this was something I just could not fix. I'm a doctor, I'm a prayerful man, and my wife keeps getting pregnant, and I can't fix the fact that she keeps losing babies. And there was a lot of tears, and there was a lot of distance. Um, 
in, in our relationship at that time. And yet she still wanted to have more kids. So we're praying about, are we going to adopt? We're going to keep trying. They put her on a bunch of hormones, trying to stabilize things. If you think a woman who's six months pregnant or six weeks pregnant has got hormonal issues, wait till they fill her up with a bunch of extra hormones. I didn't, I didn't know a woman that was laying in the bed next to me. Uh, no, I, I'm serious. And she'll tell you the same thing. I was to the point where I finally said, I don't, we'll, we'll adopt, we'll get, you know, 12 dogs, whatever you want, but you need to stop. We can't, I can't do this anymore. So we stopped. And she got up one morning and said, I don't feel good. And I didn't know that she had uh, kept a couple of those sticks in <laughs> And it was right after my grandmother passed away, and she was pregnant. And we finally made it to nine weeks, and we were really getting excited because we hadn't got past eight weeks with any child except for our daughter. And she started bleeding again. So this time we were under the care of uh, some really excellent perinatal uh, doctors and uh, they, we ran her down to uh, Charberry Birch and they did a bunch of tests and said, um, we're sorry to tell you, but you have a very large subchorionic hemorrhage. Anybody know what that is? No. no. Okay. I didn't think so. Um, so it's where the placenta is pulling away from the uterine wall. The greater the percent that pulls away, you can imagine the smaller the percentage is that this child's going to survive. And it was 50%. And both my wife and I know what that means. We're losing, we're losing another one. So they said, look, there's nothing we can do at this stage. You can go home and be on bed rest. And bro. So she went home on bed rest. And we've got a five year old daughter. And what I didn't tell you is every night before bed, during her time, my daughter Emily would pray Dear God, I love you. Please give me a baby brother. It got so that my wife couldn't pray with her because it was just too hard. It wasn't, it wasn't easy for me, either, if we're being honest. So we didn't want to tell her that my wife was pregnant because we didn't want to get her hopes up, especially knowing what we knew. And so she's laying in bed and we're making excuses about why Emily and snuggle with her. She can't jump up on the bed and give her a big hug or any of these things. Well, seven weeks later, even though she was still having some spotting, the baby's still alive. But uh, it's got a two-vessel cord. Normal cords have three vessels. And it's associated with a lot of congenital abnormalities. Down syndrome. Um, a lot of, uh, of birth defects. And so they want to do an amniocentesis. And my wife says, over my dead body. <laughs> You're not sticking a needle in me. I don't care how safe this procedure is on a doctor. And I do not want to put this child at risk. And they're like, well, you don't know what could be wrong with it. She's like, I don't care what's wrong with it. And so they did multiple ultrasounds, uh, these high-level ultrasounds, to make sure that there weren't any obvious congenital defects, which thankfully they did not find any. And six months later, my daughter had her prayer answered. And you ladies know him because he's almost as tall as I am now. We had our second son our second child, our son. Um, and then it was, we were told that uh, 
she couldn't have any more kids. Uh, there was a, an issue related to the delivery and that she was going to need to have a hysterectomy. So, um, for a long time, when people would ask me, oh, how many children do you have? I could only answer two. But I have uh, come to be able to say that I have six children. And I'm very hopeful that when the Lord calls me home, I'll get to meet those other people. So again, like life is really good, right? I'm in a great place in my my life. I actually was asked to be the to run to be the chairperson for our department. Um, it was about ten years ago. My wife is a partner in her group. Um, we are living the American dream. I uh, I used to race. I don't know if you ladies know this, but I used to race sports cars on the weekends. That was one of my me and Jim Benford, I didn't race with them, but that was what I used to do. That was my weekend fun, I'd race sports cars. And so, uh, I've got a sports car that I race. Um, I'm a doctor, I'm married to a doctor, my wife is beautiful, we have a great house, we've got a dog and a cat and two kids, one of each, everything is great, right? And I'm thinking that I'm living a pretty good life, I even a pretty good prayer life. I talk. To God all the time. And it was about 10 years ago, went to the parish mission during Lent, and um, the abbot from uh, Prince of Peace Abbey, um, Charles Wright, I don't know if you know Father Charles, so he's, he's, given a, he's given a mission, and the mission was on different forms of prayer. So one night he was talking to us about Lexio Divina, one night he's talking about contemplative prayer. One night he's talking about the beauty of the Catholic tradition of all our road prayers. And the last night, the last night, you, you guys want to guess? None of you have heard this before can answer what the prayer was that he talked about. The need for silence in prayer. And again, I thought I had the world by the tail, right? I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a race car driver. And I, in 40-something odd years of my life, had never once just been quiet in prayer. All of my conversations with God had been a one-way street. Right? Now, you know, you know the old story, right? God gave us one mouth and two, yes. right? So listening is far more important than speaking. But I had never really done that. So I decided that in my Lent journey, I would spend like five minutes at the end of my prayer time just being quiet and listening to what God had to say to me. And almost immediately, he started saying to me that he wanted me to be a deacon, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> because I didn't want to be a deacon. And it kept coming up. And I said to God, like, I don't look good in a dress, and I don't wear Miss America sash, and so, no. <laughs> because that's that's sort of my way. When I, if I'm nervous or whatever, I'll, you know, make some jokes and sort of deflect things. And, and honestly, that all I knew about being a deacon was what I told you. They, you know, they wore their alb and they had their stole and they uh, proclaimed the gospel and every once in a while they preached. And I didn't want to do any of those things. But it kept coming up. And, you know, God is nothing if he is not persistent. And so I actually had to look up what it meant to be a deacon because in all my years of cradle Catholicness, I had no idea. And when I found out what it really means to be deacon, where the term deacon comes from, it's Greek. You guys know what the Greek word deacon means? Servant. 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 Thank you. <coughs> then like, it was like the light bulb went off. I've been living my life as a servant. I'm an emergency physician. I serve the people in their worst moments of their life. I serve people who have no money don't speak the language, 
whatever, whatever need they have when they come in, they have no home, they have no food, I serve. I mean, I wanted to be a uh, public defender because I wanted to serve, right? I served my, my family by working nights for 20 years. I'd much rather work days. Um, I serve my kids. So when God said, I'm calling you to be an ordained servant, I finally said, oh, okay, baby. <laughs> no, seriously, I said, okay, baby. And I said, okay, baby, because the next issue I had with God, of course, so again, I had issues with God. I'm not angry, but I had issues. <laughs> uh, you, you see my wife, right? God, you know me better than anyone, even my wife. My life's kind of a mess. I mean, I'm good, but I'm not holy. I'm not holy. So I can't be a minister. People look up to ministers. People look up to priests. They're holy. I'm not holy. So I sat with that for an entire year. And I know it was an entire year. Because... I couldn't sit with it any longer the following Easter. We're getting ready for 9 o'clock service at St. Peter's, and my wife is like, we've got the kids, and we've got to get there early, because somebody will sit in our seat, and then we won't be able to sit, we'll be in the back, and the whole world will come to an end. <laughs> so we're getting ready, and she's, you know, getting her dress on, and I come over to her, and I say, honey, I need to talk to you. And she's like, yeah, yeah, that's great. We, we gotta go. Let's hurry up. Get your, get your tie on. Let's go. No, no, honey, I really need to talk to you. And she gave me this patented look. You ladies have all done it. <laughs> One eyebrows up. Um, I need to tell you something that I've been praying with for over a year. And God is just telling me right now that I need to tell you, and so I'm going to, um, God's calling me to be a deacon. And she says, here's my Paul, the road to Damascus moment. I know. And I, <laughs> I could have, you could have knocked me over with a feather, and I said, you know, I didn't, I didn't even say anything about it. How do you know? Because he's been telling me the same thing for the last year. And I said, well, why didn't you say something? <laughs> because he told me not to. <laughs> he told me that you were supposed to come to me. Wow. I've been asked several times, well, why do, you, why do you think God worked in that way, in that moment? And I think number one is that I'm a really hate guy. I spent most of my formation time trying to balance my heart and my head. And I think I needed that. Because I think I would have constantly sort of tried to figure out, was this me or was this God? Because, you know, I spoke, I speak to my wife about everything, everything. I mean, as a matter of fact, ask my son, Alex, we're two doctors talking at the dinner table you know, blood in your urine is nothing. Okay? And he, you know, half the time's like, time out, please stop talking. I want to eat dinner and you're making me sick. So it would have been natural for me to talk to my wife about it. But not only did I need the confirmation that this was coming from God in order to really, I think, satisfy my head. But I think I was also, quite honestly, afraid that when I said to her, God's calling me to be a deacon, that she was going to laugh at me. No, seriously. Because no, the only person who knows me better than God is my wife. And I was, I think, on some level afraid that she was going to be like, hey, you? A deacon? Right. You know how messed up you are, right? So, um, five years of formation, um, I 
had a, I think I was just telling Kathy this this morning, had to drag my 13-year-old daughter at the time to kind of get on board with that because, you know, she, as soon as we made the announcement that I was in the diaconate, everybody was coming up to her and saying, aren't you so glad that your dad's going to be a deacon? And she'd be like, no. <laughs> but it's wonderful. No, it's not. She, um, she had a hard time. She struggled with sort of the familiarity that everyone assumed they had with her because I had always been sort of um, very upfront in the parish. I, I was a Eucharistic minister. I was a, uh, a reader. I was the MC at all of our events for the school. And so people sort of thought they, they knew her. Um, and so that she struggled with that. Throughout our formation, you know, we really felt like if God was going to ordain me, then that was sort of the, the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae because my wife and I grew so much during that time in our knowledge and love of the Lord and our knowledge and love of each other. And I would not have traded that five years for anything. And honestly, if the church had said, you know, said, sorry, Ted, but we actually figured out who you are. <laughs> You're a big fat sinner. We're not going to ordain you. I've been like, okay, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. As a matter of fact, there's some things where I still think like, sure, you sure you ordained me? Because I'm really, I've got a lot on my plate right now, and I sort of wish I wasn't ordained. Um, during the last year of formation, it became very clear to me that God was calling me to be a minister full time. And it was interesting because at the same time I was being asked um, to be the department head um, of the emergency department. This is in the middle of COVID. And um, I had a, a bunch of my partners tell me that they really felt that I, I was the person to be able to help lead the department where it needed to go. And that was very um, sort of ego gratifying. And uh, what had usually happened, which was that the department heads would then become the chief of staff. And so, um, I'd always wanted to be the chief of staff. <laughs> I'm a real type A kind of guy, and I just like, <coughs> just like, like Dr. Rotunda, chief of staff. It sounds like a TV show you want to watch, right? But it was really, I, like, honest, honest to goodness, honest to the Lord, I, I, as soon as I was asked, I said, you know what, no, it's not the right time for me to do this. And it was really, really clear that God was calling me to retire from emergency medicine and to do diagonal ministry full time. So again, I'm, I'm praying about it and I'm going to talk to my wife and she comes home and I've got a cot, and I do all the cooking, right? And I've got a cocktail ready for her. And she comes in and she throws down her bag and she kicks off her shoes and she goes, something's got to give. Uh, here's, a, here's a cocktail for you. Huh? <laughs> well, thank God for that. Because if I have another day like this, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I can tell you, if something doesn't give, I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe I need to quit. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, told, I, I told God, I'm like, well, uh, um, you're braver than I am, but I've been married to her for 27 years, and there's no way I'm telling her that I need to retire right now. I'm just not that dumb. So, about a month later, same thing, got the cocktails, everything ready, she comes home, and I'm like, honey, I really need to tell you, but I feel like God's calling me to retire, and she screams, and I'm like, oh, you're, this is how we go. This is the end. This is how they're going to put that on the tombstone. She throws her arms around my neck and gives me a huge hug and a kiss and says, Thank God. I have been waiting for you to tell me to, that you need to retire. Um, but I didn't want to be the one to tell you. And I said, Well, I feel like God's calling me to full, full time ministry. And she, what did she say? I know. I know. See, my wife, my wife is a mystic. You ladies may not. No, no, I'm, I'm not kidding you. Um, I work really hard at my connection with the Lord through through prayer. My wife, it just comes easy for her. God speaks to her all the time, which is why I always 
check with her before I said yes or no to anything. <laughs> so I am, um, I am a, a my, my daughter refers to me as Triple D. It's not diners, drive-ins, and dives. It's Deacon Dr. Dad. Um, and that's, you know, somebody asked me the other day, well, should we call you doctor or deacon? And I'm like, well, is it your body or your soul that needs ministry? <laughs> so I am now a full-time um, deacon at St. Peter's, uh, which my... I can hear Father Arturo clapping all the way from Albury uh, because our our pastor is uh, does not have any associates, and so um, I, that's I'm sort of filling in that role as much as I can as a deacon. Um, let me bring you back to my first story: the story of this woman who moves in with her sister and her brother and is raising this. Uh, baby girl. Uh, this baby girl um, grows up as they do, uh, finds a nice young man, and uh, he proposes to her after uh, he gets um, his diploma and has a job. And they struggle with having children themselves, and they're just at the point where they're getting ready to uh, go to an adoption agency and she finds out that she's pregnant. And nine months later, during a blizzard in January, they give birth to their first son. And they name him after her dad, the dead coal miner. They name him Ted. tell you that story. And I wanted to talk to you about that Good Shepherd picture. Because when I was 13, during the time I was having my issue with my kidney, I would walk in and see my grandmother. She lived with us. And when I would be walking out, I would notice that she would pick up her tissue blotter her eyes and it seemed like every time I went in to talk to her, she would be crying when I left. And I said to my mom, I said, hey, um, did I do something? We, we referred to her as Nan. I said, did I do something to like upset Nan? Did I say something wrong to her? Because every time I walk out of the room, she's always crying. And my mom says, it's because you look just like your grandfather. And she shows me a picture where he was a few years older than I was. And honestly, if I had his picture and my high school senior picture next to each other, we could be brothers. And my mom told me the story of what happened. I, I never knew what happened to my grandfather. It just, just never came up. I think it was probably too painful for them to discuss. And from that point on in my life, I always felt like I was living for the both of us. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't just about my life, but it was also about his life as well. A life that he never really got to live. You know, we, I talked about offering suffering up. My grandmother never remarried. She said she had a perfect marriage with my grandfather and that there was no reason to get married ever again because nothing would be as good as it was for those couple years that they had together. We can sometimes feel that in our lives there's this suffering that we have and we don't know what to do with it. And I would ask you to remember that when suffering comes into your life, to offer it up to God and to know that God can bring good out of it. And we don't always see where that good is going or coming from. But I know that if my grandfather had not passed away, I wouldn't be here speaking with you. Because my grandmother moved from Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, out to Long Island, and that's where she met my father. That's where they fell in love and had me. I 
I don't want you to think that somehow God decided to take my grandfather from my grandmother in order for me to be here speaking to you today. But I do like to think that in that great tragedy in my grandmother's life, God was able to bring some good. I gave a homily a couple months ago about a woman who was a patient of my wife's. She came in eight years after I saw her in the emergency department. She said to my wife, she goes, are you related to the Dr. Rotunda who works in the emergency department? And usually my wife would just say, no. <laughs> because generally speaking, people just want to complain about how many hours they waited. But she said yes. And the woman, her patient, said, please thank him for me. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be alive today. I, I, don't, I don't know how many lives I have touched in my life in being a physician, how many people I was able to give a kind word to, a meal to, or their life to. But I like to think that I was doing that not only for my grandfather, as I look back on my life, that I was not living my life just for my grandfather, but I was living my life for my father in heaven, trying to make him proud of me. And I realized after going through formation that he was already proud of me, that the brokenness that I saw, he just saw the child that he loves so much. As a deacon, we're called to be heralds of the gospel. We're supposed to be sort of steeped in scripture. And scripture like prayer is lifeless if it doesn't lead you to God and to taking care of your brothers and sisters on this planet. As Father pointed out, I don't care if they're Catholic or Christian or Buddhist or we're called to love everyone. We're called to be Christ for everyone. Let the scripture that you are learning and living transform you into Christ for the world that so desperately needs him. That's it. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to tell you about this picture. No, seriously. You, come on up, man. This picture, this exact picture, hung in my grandmother's house. When I walked in, I don't know if the frame was the same, but that picture of Jesus the Good Shepherd was in my grandmother's house. When I walked in here today, I was, I knew that she was looking down on me. So anyway. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? No? You're good. I'm good. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, David. You're good. Thank you. Have a blessing. Have a blessing for us today. So we're going to bless our food and we thank God for Father Mike Berry, our deacon from Tunda. And we ask God's grace and mercy upon them as well. So let us pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you're a mighty God, the Holy One of Israel. And you, you have called each one of us, Lord, today to hear this message, Lord, and to grow in faith. And so we ask that you take the words that were shared with us today um, and plant seeds in our heart that will give you eternal glory. In your name, Jesus, we love you. And so, um, let us pray. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive. I am to Christ our